everybody, Lou Santiago. I hope you like our new opening because I thought it was pretty cool. Looks like a 64 Pontiac, I, you know, but hey, what do I know about cars? Tonight, we got a great show. I'm going to bring John in here in a little bit, and we're going to chat. There he is. There's John. Oh, hey. Oh, a little early. How you doing? That was pretty quick, wasn't it? Don't worry. You're good. Dude. Wake up. So we're moving fast ah. because our guest talks slow, so we're going to move fast so we can give him maximum coverage. That's what we're doing. But first, I got to do a little bit of house cleaning. Next week, we have Justin Padfield of Scott's Hot Rods, John. How about I that? I know. I know. That's it's cool talking to him. Yeah, he was out of Barrett Jackson. That's a good. That's going to be a good show. It's going to be a good show. It's going to be good. He's going to give us the down low on everything. I know he will. And then we have Rachel and Dion Thuros of R and D Garage. We right. have Richard Rawlings. That's right, Gas Monkey Garage on June sixteenth, and he right. also revived his podcast called The Monkey Trap. So just remember that. And then we got something that everybody should enjoy, John. We got Dennis McCarthy. Yep. That is well, you guys, that's going to be pretty cool. Talk about tell tell him about John. Just tell him about John. You, you know Dennis. I mean, you know Dennis, Dennis is I, the car coordinator for all the Fast and Furious movies. I talked to him a couple times. Dennis does about three hundred plus cars for the Fast and Furious movies in a few months. Right. What's cool is see the car he's sitting on Mopar. More than likely, believe it or not, it has an LS motor in it. He told me he drops LSs and everything, so when they wreck it, he can pull it, keep on going instead of trashing the whole vehicle. He's right. got some really cool stories of shutting down Fast and Furious and having to ship cars overnight in a plane to get them on set in Europe so they can keep on going. That's they crazy. give him the script. He figures out what car fits, just like somebody f figuring out an outfit or a suit or whatever for the guy. It's actually pretty cool. That is cool. And he's that, the man behind the scenes that does all that. So that's going to be – that's – Dennis is actually after Richard Rollins. He's the week after. And then after Dennis, we have Troy Ladd, Hollywood Hot Rods, ANBR winner. And now I got to tell you what's going on with my shop, John. Yep. I got just about everything in it. It's a little snug, but, you know, I'm making room. I got some stuff I can still put in a container, and then the container will be full. <laughs> I got so much stuff, and uh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start firing stuff up. Whether I'm make doing something for Garage Insider TV, I got um, I got an S10 I got to do, and I got this Mustang I got to do before I get back on the Del Rey. And the Del Rey and the Slow Bourbon are at the house, so we're moving forward. Yep. Luke, and, you uh, think, hold on for a sec. Do you think we should explain these hats or no? Just keep on going. Just keep on going. <laughs> just keep on going. <laughs> No, 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 pick it up when we bring on our guest. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm with you. Keep them in suspense. No idea <laughs> what. <Okay. laughs> John, I didn't know. Real, real quick, this is on a personal note for John. John, yeah. I did not know that you celebrated your 24th wedding anniversary last week. 24th wedding anniversary. Been with my wife since 94. Met her in 94, got married in 97. Lou, when we met, she said, don't even talk about sex until we get married. After we were <laughs> married, she said, you can talk about it all you want. <laughs> so, it ain't happening. I'll tell you, I got it rough. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but it, 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 you know my wife i got a good wife i'm lucky yeah. what's up with me i don't know how anybody could do it so, so and the other thing is if everything goes right i'm thinking what next week we're gonna we're gonna be able to take phone calls you think next week got the box today okay so we, we got a box and it's it's designed so you can take phone calls so that may that may make the show a little bit longer, but that's okay. We can always talk longer. It's not a big deal. And then next week, okay. hold on. Next week, Thursday, right? It's your birthday. So people can call in and wish you happy birthday. We get that set up. Okay. Well, 27? <laughs> yeah, 27. Yeah. 27. 27. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. And then uh now just for you guys who know, a few weeks ago we had Linda Vaughn and she had really bad internet internet connection. So it didn't come out like we wanted. So we're going to bring Linda Vaughn back. We're working on that. This way we can get her scheduled, get her in, and give you guys a really good show because Linda's a hoot. And, you know, we got we to gotta talk about the Power Tour. But, you know, that's where we're at, man. 
uh, I, I, the back up, Linda Vaughn was texting me today. I was checking in on her. You know, okay. I, a, I check in, I don't know, every week or so, make sure, you know, things are good. She said she wasn't doing well. Um, told her I'd circle back in a little bit because it's podcast night. But uh, right. yeah, I, I'll explain more off air when she approves uh, some of the things we're talking about and get it up cool. and help her out. But I'm still working on that. I know there's people out there who know exactly what I'm talking about from that show itself. But uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is I also heard, you know, we were talking last couple of days about Barrett Jackson. Uh, yeah. Carolyn, Carolyn Jackson actually reached out to me today, wants to talk tomorrow. Oh. So I'm going to keep you in the loop as to what happens there. Yeah. Uh, I registered to go to Vegas June 17th, the day after Rawlings, 17th through 19th for Barrett Jackson. Right. I'm throwing it out there to you if you want to go and uh you know check it out. Hey, Barrett Barrett Jackson, let me write that down. 17th through 19th. Thursday through Saturday, I will be there. Ed's going. Mike from Wicked Flow said he'd be there if, if you know if we go. Yeah. So just something to think about. I know that's uh short notice. Airfare is up. Ticket yeah. from here right now, 750 bucks. Wow. Well, it's steep. That that's, is steep. That's uh, coach. It's not nothing fancy. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. I can drive for I could drive for less money in gas. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to figure that out because uh, <laughs> you may have to come you may have to come get me. I can do we're that. Gonna to, we're gonna have to get an RV. <clears throat> Make that's it like the good old boys from the blues brothers. There you go. Get the gas and keep going. That's it. There you, you know go. Right? There you go. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring in our guest tonight. And for you guys in the YouTube world, you know who he is. His name is Derek Berry. He is Vice Grip Garage. So, and when he comes in, you'll get the whole hat thing. All right, Derek, where you at? There he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm the bad guy here. <laughs> go for your guns. Looking good. I like the hat, fellas. There we go. Here we go. You know, we had we had to be prepared. <laughs> we didn't want to feel left out. No, I, I like it. I mean, we got all the colors in here. All right. <laughs> pretty good. All right. Red, white, and blue. Everybody's looking patriotic and shit, right? Yeah. Dude, he's really? got it. Her birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. That's pretty awesome. He's yours was the other day. Was happy birthday. Great. What was yours? Uh, Sunday? Derek, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't 28? Know. Wait, 28, 29? It's like oh, birthday month. Thank you. Look at that. How's your wife? Mac delivery. Um, what did I turn? Thirty-seven? I'm not sure. What? Something like that. Thirty-seven. He's young. In my thirties. Yeah. It don't matter after you turn twenty-one. It's all downhill. From yeah, that. it's all the same. They all click yeah, off. Yeah, They're all yeah. the same. Time flies. Believe yeah. me, it flies. Yeah. Trust me, I'm on bonus time as it is. So. <laughs> this is yeah. Crazy. Look, what are you going to be? Fifty-six. Eight. No, yeah, you're, you're really? 58. Yeah, yeah, I'll be wow. fifty. Well, you're yeah, doing I, well, sir. I just, I just tell everybody that I pickled my dash with good looks when I was in the military from all the drinking I did. <laughs> <laughs> all the drinking, drinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can attest to the, the them fellers in the barracks. They can drink. I just, oh yeah. Oh, so, oh my goodness. Oh yeah. I thought yeah. I was, my nickname used to be Beer Man Beery, and then I went to the barracks and I just psh, I canceled that one because I couldn't hang. That was something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, um, it was funny yeah. because it was it was last summer in Navy times. They said that a Marine amphibious group went up to Iceland and did like a, you know a Liberty Port thing, and mm -hmm. they said that they drank the town dry. And they brought booze in from two other towns. And they <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe oh, it. I believe it too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You just drink and run and drink and run and drink yeah. and run. That's yeah. All it. yeah. When I was it, in Guam, it, I, every Saturday morning, we would run from the CB camp to the, to the beach and back. And I want to say it was a six mile run round trip, but we'd also swim out. We would swim out to the first buoy, which was a half mile, and then swim back. And I'd, I'd stay out drinking all night, come back in, put on my shorts and a, and a clean T-shirt, and go run. I'd be running, throwing up. 
Sure. Before I sure. left, I'd be like, all oh, you fellers better know CPR because I'm drowning today. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a guarantee. laughs> I get tired driving six miles. I don't know how you run six miles. <laughs> Derek, Derek, for those who don't know, can you explain your channel, what you're known for? I mean, you know what? I'm surprised that you two guys haven't come across each other and, and hung out prior to this. You know, you know it's, I, mean? I was kind of thinking about it today. I, I put a post up on InstaLetter and FaceSpace or whatever they are. And it's like, I've been watching Lou for years. This is humbling for me. Like, this is completely surreal that I'm even talking to you fellers. And it's just... um you know, we just play with cars. We build hot rods. We try to get kids involved. We pay it back to veterans, um, you know, anybody that we can that that is down on their luck. And one day I just picked up a camera and said, I'm going to try this YouTube thing. I literally taped a broken phone to my garage door. It was my first video. And uh, did a swap and a 69 Camaro, and it kind of just took off from there. But um, it, I, I'm just a good old boy building hot rods with my friends, having fun, just doing things on a budget and making stuff run. And I mean, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Yeah. Nothing fancy. Nothing. <laughs> Derek, when you find a car, you're, you're focused in on one, whatever it is, because what amazes me, like the 70 Cadillac that you did, how, what, what, you know, questions you ask out in front to, to be able to qualify that car and go, yeah, I'm going to pick this up. It's not, it can't be just the price. You have to know that that thing didn't blow a transmission. Do you ask the people that, or is it just an unknown no. story? Typically, what's what happens before you roll the camera? No, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but I've, you know, I've right now I have probably a dozen purchased vehicles out in front of me that I've never even laid eyes on that I just have in inventory, so to speak. And I buy them sight unseen because that's the way the internet works today. Everybody has to have everything immediately. Right. And you can't go look at anything anymore before it's sold. So right. um, I got used to this PayPal stuff and the, the Venoms or Venmos or whatever it is. And basically I say, does it run? And they say, nope. And I say, is it in bad condition? And they say, yep. And then I say, I'll take it. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes I ask if it has a key, but I mean, other than that, it doesn't really. The biggest thing for me is if I spend the time and money getting it, can I sell it to get out of it? So that's why usually you'll see vehicles on my channel that are, you know, they're worth a little bit of money running because that's my right. goal. Because I'll, I'll put a lot of money into these cars just to get them, you know, like that caddy I had several thousand dollars before I even got home in that thing, you know? So end of the day, it kind of is a business. You got to be able to get out of the thing. But of course, like everything else, I fell in love with it and it's sitting in the tree roll with the other four dozen cars. So, <laughs> you know, you know why, John, you know why John's interested in that Cadillac, right? Yeah. You want it? <laughs> John's Italian. That's what they were. <laughs> Yo, this hat doesn't say that though. <laughs> this hat says I'm a Texan. Yeah, that, that was a really. Do you guys want to hear the story behind that car? Because I guess yeah, I, I do. Hear. I do. Yeah. I was going to ask you. Yeah. So it's such a bizarre thing. Um, I can't. I think I paid thirty eight hundred dollars for that car. Is what they were asking for. <laughs> And um, I saw it was a triple white four door hard top. Of course, it has a big block, posi, you know, electric everything, fully loaded. And it had original miles and all this stuff, supposedly. And I called Lady, and it was the sister of the, I, her brother owned it. And he bought it brand new way back in the day. And supposedly he had a drug and alcohol problem, and he had a newborn kid on the way. And the father kept threatening the feller, you know, if you keep acting up and partying and all this and that, you know, it's going to come to you and I'm going to take your car away or whatever. Well, that kid kept it up. And one night he came home loaded and the dad took the keys and drove it down into what was then a swamp back in the day and got it stuck and hid the keys from his son and never gave him back. And there it sat. So that was the story I was told because I think the car only has like 30,000 miles or something like on, that on it. Okay. And, uh, and so I was just one of those things, right place, right time. 
and uh, was able to make a deal on the car. And other than the rust where it was sitting down in that water, it is a very, very straight car. Got pretty lucky on that one. Man. Yeah, the interior looked like, I mean, it's white and it's been sitting. It looked like it was pretty clean. I mean, it looked decent. It wasn't all, you know, ratted out where it was. I mean, I know that you had water and some issues and things living (laughs) under it and all that. But overall, I mean, that looks horrible, but so be it. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty solid. I mean, it smelled like, you know, dirty diapers and oatmeal. But other than that, I mean, it cleaned up pretty good. And we're going to do some more work with it on the channel. My wife fell in love with it, too. And uh, I think there was only like 2,700 made that year of the triple white. So we might hang on to that, yeah. that car there. Yeah. And that's the air ride. You see that bottle on that that suspension arm there going to the fender well that's yeah. a compressor for the air ride that was i yeah. think that was the first year of that so pretty cool car it had all the yeah, yeah wow. 70 is a cool car it was like the convertibles i mean that's not in bad shape for being white sitting in a field usually it's yeah. trash you know i mean everything looks decent it's not for sitting in a, in a field that's pretty amazing yeah, I was blown away. They had a tarp on it for a while, and um, I guess after so many years, that kind of rotted away. And of course, rubbed the paint on the fenders and quarter panels and things like that. But I think that's ultimately what saved the interior was having those, those yeah tarps on it. At least they had the wherewithal to do that at some point. But it cleaned up pretty darn good, and we're happy with it for sure. The paint look, the the hood, the paint came. Yeah good when you you clearly you you obviously i mean cleaned it up it looks good yeah it's a it's like a 27.3 footer somewhere in there Not <laughs> it's a bar it's a bar <laughs> say if it was me i'd cut the roof off i'd make it a, i'd make it a parade make it car cut the roof. i would i would yeah i would just do something like that and lou would chop it up lou chops up everything i'd put it in the dirt <laughs> but you know what derek you know what i like most is when you're watching your videos. It seems like, and I know you're narrating and explaining it, but it sounds like, man, you're in your head. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm saying. And it's just hilarious because you're almost talking to yourself going, oh my God, what, what is this? What is that? What's going on here? And it's, you feel, I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool position. I like the point of view. It's pretty yeah. funny. And I think that's what works really, really well. You know, yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I think it depends on who you talk to. One of my wife's friends is the therapist, and according to her, I'm mentally unstable. So, <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? Therapist. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and seriously, <laughs> I grew up with my grandpa, who you know, obviously was twice my age, and and um, I remember as a, just a kid, six, seven, eight years old, hanging out with him in the shop, and. It would just be me and him, and he'd be out there, you know, with a torch or whatever. And I wonder if a guy could bend this and hammer this over and cut this. And he'd look at me, and I'm like, I don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't have any idea. And that's kind of where I learned just to air things out and talk to yourself. I mean, I pretty much do all day long. I'm, I, it's just a one-man show. You know, I'm the camera and operator and mechanic and editor and you name it. So, yeah pretty much just talk to myself all day long and that's just i just like to narrate things and let people know what i'm thinking and where i'm at and oh, what works. Go wrong, which usually does you know but you know I, I was telling lou i said uh, <laughs> you know it seems like derek even being a young dude at 37 he has a, an old soul there's an old part especially when you talk about showing the kids, getting kids involved. You got your boys involved, but you can tell that somebody passed it down. And then I saw or heard or read the story. And I, I'm, I'm hoping you repeat it here about your, your, the motor blew up in the combine and your yeah. dad pulled, it seemed like your, your grandpa and your dad, whatever it takes, get it done. No excuses, make it happen type of people. You know, what you yeah. have around, make it work. Tell the story about the combine and the engine, please. Sure, absolutely. So kind of to preface that, we, I grew up on uh, a dirt farm way, way northwest of North Dakota. I don't know. It was like North Pole. We were right on the edge of Canada, basically. Yeah. And so we didn't have the parts store and the grocery store and, and the whatever else is. 
Um, you know, I grew up in hand-me-downs and so forth. So if something broke, basically, is what I'm saying, you know, dad and my grandpa, and my uncles, we just had to figure it out. You'd go to the scrapyard and there's a hundred years of junk there and you cut what you need or you take what you need or you figure it out. And I was a young boy and uh, I think the first time I realized that we were kind of in hard times was we had an old, I think it was a Massey Ferguson combine, which had a small block Chevy in it and it was harvest time and engine was down and we had, I think it was a 78 Chevy pickup, cherry red, had the white wagon wheels on it and the white letter tires can remember it like yesterday, toolbox, four speed, cool truck. And um, I remember my dad just taking the engine out. And I'm thinking, why is he doing that? The truck runs. And then I'm watching him put it in the combine. And I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense. And then it kind of dawned on me that he's just doing whatever he had to do to bring the crop in. Cause then today that's how you pay bills. Right. So it was right. engine out of the truck into the combine, get the harvest done, put it back in the truck to go to town basically. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's just how we grew up. It was just always beg, borrow, and and make things work and, and just cobble things together. And it was a lot of fun. And looking back on it, I think it, it really made me who I am today, which is just appreciate everything. Appreciate everything. You don't have to have a lot to be appreciative, you know. And yeah. I try to teach my kids that a little is a lot and just whatever you can get don't take it for granted and be thankful and find unique ways to make things possible. And money doesn't solve everything. You know, hard work does, you know, yep. yeah. so. you're right. So, so you have a working farm now, right? Uh, it's not, it's no longer mine. It's still in the family, but it's, it's leased. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, we think 140 some years now that farm's been. Wow operating yeah and wow. uh bringing in a lot of good crops uh wheat and soy and and uh the bins are still full and we've been awfully thankful and my cousins are up on the farm now we still run cattle so i still go up and we brand every year and we help with harvest if we can if we have the time and, and uh we just it's a family legacy you know i'm yeah I'm technically in the city but you know all the family just converges every year to make sure that we get we get harvest in and we get the cattle taken care of and, and everything else. So it's a lot of fun. For Derek, sure. How many, how many acres? It looks like, I mean, you, you see forever in, in your videos. How many acres uh, was the farm? So I grew up on, I think it was just shy of 1200. And I think my grandfather had about 2200 acres. So, you know, on, on Google earth, you could basically see, you know, our farms cause they were back to back pretty much. And I was lucky enough to grow up in the time where, you know, I'd run out of the house barefoot in the morning and my mom would say, hey, be home when the sun goes down. And we would just go do our thing. You know, we would run through the trees and build tree houses and chase coyotes and eat weird things and get injured and, <laughs> you know, just figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, come home in the evening. And it was a lot of fun. And that's, that's try, you know, we're trying to do that with our children is, you know, be protective, but also give them enough leash to figure it out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. See in New York, we used to just, we used to be out till the street lights came on. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of that. We did it in the city. <laughs> yeah. It was free game during the daylight hours. <laughs> yeah. One of the first things our dad tried to teach us was the old finger and the sunset thing, you know, so you could, figure out what time it was based on the sunset and the horizon. So three fingers to the horizon, you had to start heading home because you had about 40 minutes or so. So no yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a different cool. life. I've never heard that one. Yeah. It's never heard it. pretty cool. It was a lot of fun, man. You ever played uh, hide and seek in a wheat field when you were a kid? That was a blast because you're in 300 acres of wheat and you wouldn't see your contender for 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you ever lose anybody? Anybody go missing? No. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, we we gave up, and went home, and someone would come back three hours later. You know, <laughs> There's one way over there. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Derek, oh. when you're doing a, when you're putting something together, what's the sketchiest thing you've done and going, you know what? It's a lick and a promise. I'm turning the key. I'm going for it. What is there anything you go that one there? I really got away with it. Shouldn't have. Um, as far as builds, I mean, I, I try to keep my builds. They're all sketchy and, <laughs> but they're not like super dangerous. They're like right. really dangerous. I think the sketchiest thing I'd done was drive that um, car that's known as Independent Chevelle home. It's a 1972 yeah. Chevelle. And oh, there it is right there. Yeah. So I actually off camera stopped, I want to say three or four times and legitimately prayed and just said, I. It was to the point where I felt like I was endangering other people's lives because it, it was like driving a wet noodle. No matter what I did with the steering wheel, it didn't correlate with where the vehicle was going. Wow. And the frame was so bad. I could hear the door jams just creaking and smashing together. And, and, um, but Holy. there was just part of me that said, this is, you got to do it. You got to make this, you got to make this thing home. Yeah. Yeah. So, we pushed it and that was a long day i think it took me 13 14 hours to get home there were seven holes in that frame the size of a fist three or four cracks um the drag link was hitting the cross member the ball joints were shot i mean it was just the most wore out car you could ever imagine and um that was one time i was really questioning my you know, it was just like, is it worth it putting it on the road, basically? And not for my health. I mean, I'll wrap myself around a telephone pole. That's no problem. But I don't want to hit another vehicle with a family in it or something, you know. Right, right. right. So I would say that was definitely the, the sketchiest for me. Uh, you still, that where's that car at now? You still got it? What'd you do? Yeah, it? yeah, still got it. It's uh, it's about a 1,000 horsepower right now, pro-charged, 460 um it's got every bell and whistle you can think of disc brakes roll cage um it's got a built turbo 400 in it um we just do burnout competitions with it right now because the frame again is i patched it but it's so rough that i can't do quarter mile or yeah or anything mm -hmm. with it. so we yeah. just twist, twist it up in the burnout box but it's a lot of fun i mean when I get out of that car at the end of a burnout and 20,000 fans are chanting USA, it's the coolest thing that you could ever imagine. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's really rad. We just did a competition in Indianapolis and about made a guy cry, to be honest, just waving a flag and hearing the crowd chant and, and uh, it just makes it all worth it. You know? Yeah. Right. So, now the body, did, did you do anything to the body or is that you keep it just as it is? Um, what I did was you see there, like the roof is like a tan rust mm -hmm. color and it kind of lost the red where the red stripes were. Yeah. So I Fox tinted in paint, um, where all that tan was and sprayed in some white again. So the red and white bars are a lot brighter. And, um, and then I put my patented shine juice on it, which is a bowl of linseed oil, some, Earth Ghost Juice, a little bit of WD-40, <laughs> and some other stuff. Put some nice shine on it, and uh, that's it. Put some wheels on it, and that's how it's going to stay. I even still have the broke-out uh, turn signals in it. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. So what rear end did you put in that thing? It still has the 8.5 10 bolt. <laughs> no way. Yes, yes. Oh, and my God. I put a mini spool in it and I was like, this is going to last one burnout and it's done. You know, C clip, yeah, fine or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's hanging in there. It won't That's give up. Crazy. I just, I don't understand it. It's you got that tiny lie. little, I think it's like a 1310 U joint, those tiny little U joints. Yep, 1310. Yeah. And yeah. it just won't break. It just baffles me. That's, that's crazy i think it's because it just doesn't hook up you know what i mean yeah I that's probably that's, what it is it, i'm positive that's got to be what it is i mean that's the same with my transmission guy when he built that 400 he's like 
Best thing you can do is pray this thing never gets gripped. So <laughs> you need yeah. to be in third gear immediately and just keep them spinning. I was like, well, I could do that. That sounds fun. <laughs> That's the easy part. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So what's the deal with the 56 Buick? I saw that video the other week, the other day. <laughs> yeah. That's a cool car, man. A really cool car. Um, let's see. My dad bought that in 80. Eight, I want to say it used to be canary yellow and white and um, when I was a kid I'd ride around with my grandpa and my dad to junkyards and old farmsteads and every piece on that car you see the headlight trim the front grille bar the bumpers the portholes all of that came off of other cars that we traveled around that car was just a you know a burnt up shell basically and even the intake and carburetor everything but he built that car um, when I was a kid and had it for a long, long time. And when he passed away, I inherited it. And uh, long story short, when I had my kids, I had twins. Um, it was a hard decision, but we ended up selling the car after I had restored it. I'm the one that painted it black and white. And of course, I regretted it immediately. And it took me over a decade to track that car down. I mean, really? Really? Oh, yeah, it was a lot of work. And finally found it, made the guy an offer. He kept turning it down. And um, finally, I think it was five or six months ago, I made him a stupid offer. I'm talking like Meekum auto auction offer. Oh, boy. And uh, he finally said, yes, I'll take it. So I flew down and uh, paid him, jumped in it was a prayer and a Harbor Freight toolbox and headed for Minnesota and did not make it. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Explain what happened. Oh, uh, you know, it, it's something with the, it has a Dynaflow transmission, which I rebuilt um, two times. First time I messed it up. Dynaflows are tough. It's a, yeah. nine, it's an art to get them dialed in. Right. But it's something with the torque ball or the torque tube. And it sounded like the output shaft, and there must be a old ball bearing bearing in there. And uh, it was just banging and slamming, and it really wasn't happy. And I knew if I drove it any further, it was going to get worse and worse and worse and probably tear the rear end out. So I did the right thing, and um, what did I do? Oh, I went to the bar and had a couple cold snacks, bought a pickup site on scene. And went and got that pickup, rented a U-Haul trailer, and then pulled that car all the way home with a pickup that I bought off the interwebs. It was a, I think it was an 87 Chevy pickup or something like that. Square body. Yep, square body. It did fine. Made it all the way home. No issues. That's cool. So I watched another video with that C, uh, the C50, the, the, the hay truck. Oh, yeah, the hay truck, yep. Yeah, man, what are you going to do with that thing? You know, we're um, I've got some acreage up there, and we're fencing it off this year, and and um, we're wanting to do, you know, level out some area and just put a camper in and stuff like that for like a, just like a summer getaway cabin or hunting or something like that. And, and just to keep that truck moving, I think I'm going to put tires on it, and we'll just use it to haul trees and rocks and dirt and you know, whatever we can, um, just to keep the thing going. And to be honest, if I can't find a reason to use it, I'm just going to ease it to town and have breakfast and get some gas. And it's cool. Home. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. It's I cool. learned to drive manual in that truck. It was, uh, my whole lesson was, or how did he say it? <clears throat> I think it was 11. He said, put it in, put it in number one for gear. Turn the key and it'll start. And when you want to stop, turn the key off. Uh, <laughs> no clutch. For, for about an hour, I did that. I'm like, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> There's something wrong here. There's yeah, jerking you around. You know, like, oh my god! I've done that. Yeah, and then I've done and, that to get home. Yeah, and then I figured out like, okay, this third pedal does a thing where it revs up and kind of figured it out. But that's how my family is. It's like. They just tell you, they just give you minimal instruction and, and a guy will figure it out basically. I got it. And yeah, right. I, 
I put in, I think, a 14-hour day hauling hay that day. And by the time I got home, I was like, Grandpa, you didn't tell me how to drive the truck. He's like, I knew you'd figure it out eventually. It's like, okay. <laughs> geez, cost of a clutch and a starter, but I guess I figured it out, you know. Derek, what did you think once once your page, your YouTube started to blow up and started to gain momentum and get crazy? What were you thinking? What was it like beforehand and what's it like now? Because you got a lot of followers, you got a lot of traction. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's still it's still surreal to me. I just definitely not used to it, you know. Um, you know, I can pretty much any part store I walk into, everyone's like, Oh my gosh, there's you know, Derek with Vice Grip Garage, and I'm I'm still like, What? Like, <laughs> but um I, the biggest thing that that I'm positive will not change is who I am, I guess, is is the thing is like I want folks to know that, you know, Vice Grip Garage isn't going to change. I'm not going to change who I am. My morals are going to stay the same. You know, the channel is going to stay the same. Uh, but it's definitely a lot different having folks approach me. I'm, I'm still not used to that. I probably will never be used to that. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. The biggest thing is for me, that makes me smile is is um, the younger kids that will come up and say, hey, you taught me how to change my water pump or, you know, pack my wheel bearings or read spark plugs or, and yeah. man, that feels really good. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, I know exactly. teach, you know, they don't teach that anymore. And, and Lou does a great job of teaching. You've been doing it for years, you know, and um, that makes me really smile and it makes me want to work harder is when, younger generation say you give me the confidence to go buy trucks or cars or you know put a little money into it figure it out and um that re really gives me um you know some gusto to keep going and keep doing what i'm doing for sure yeah well i mean you know you, you got you came by that honestly i mean you, your early influences when you think about it your dad and your grandfather who else was there that influenced you because i mean that's that comes from family that kind of that mentality yeah i mean that's that's all it's it's always been family for me i mean it's my my dad my grandpa my uncles um my dad like any guy i guess he had a, a business and he his reason for advertising was um or his race car was his reason for advertising right so he had a race car so when i was a kid real young kid um, I had to stand on a milk crate, basically. I was changing spark lighters out and doing all this stuff, and he was teaching me all this stuff. And it, I didn't realize it then how rare of an opportunity it was to be leaning over a fender of a race car at that young of an age, having, you know, the pits. There's 100 years of racing technology and information and, and all these folks in there kind of teaching and, and fostering you and, and all this knowledge and stuff like that. And it's just, I guess it's just how you're raised end of day, honestly, is, yeah. is kind of how you get into this stuff. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Shoot. Like, you can't complain about that. It's just, it just makes it good. I mean, you've got to, you obviously have a good work ethic because you're just showing up in, in places like Texas <laughs> and going, oh, I'm going to drive this car home. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that unless you have confidence. You just can't do it. You know what I mean? So that, that's very cool. And that's good to pass on. It really, truly is. So when you, so you've got twins. You said you got twin boys or twin girls? Twin boys, yeah. So how old are they? So my twin boys are almost 12, and then my little dude is nine. So I've got actually got three so, boys. So have you already put them in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the hay truck? And taught them how to drive. Um, so the the twins are learning right now on a '67 F250 four speed. <laughs> and then, uh, my little dude, he's um, he wants to go into Bandit go kart racing, which is a winged. Uh, yeah. It's like a mini sprint, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he he is a daredevil. He'll come around the shop and his go kart or his dirt bike just wide open, and I'm terrified, like. Oh, no, Rick. Mom's gonna be mad. 
<laughs> and you know, he's just, you know, he'll stop and be like, how can we make this faster? And I'm like, well, we could put a different sprocket on it. And he's like, yes, buy one of those then. Like, <laughs> buy one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely in trouble. But, um, you know, if you watch the videos, it's like um, if they want something, I'm making them work for it. You know, my kids all, they tune up their own cars. They check the fluids. They clean the, the sparklators. They work on the carburetors. They... You know, because I want to teach them that not only is this what you should be doing, and it's valuable to know, but if you if you want something, you've got to earn it. Like you've got to you've got yeah. to earn and earn your way to get there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I told all my boys. They have their cars picked out what they want. I said you can have them, but Dad's not going to do any work on them. You're going to have to do all the work. I'll I'll show you how, and I'll teach you how, but you're going to turn the wrench. Yeah, yeah. So they have. I take it the cars are on the property already. Yeah, yeah. So um, my one of the twins has the '67 F250. He likes that one. The other one likes the '65 C10, known as Lawsuit, and uh, we call it Lawsuit because of the pending lawsuit that I'm sure is going to happen. I mean, there's no, there's no body panel left. It's all license plates and road signs and i mean the seats aren't even that is a crazy truck um we're going to turbo that one dual carb um, do some fun stuff and then my young or yeah then my youngest has uh he likes the 69 camaro known as cancer camaro because it has so much rust uh, but he wants that one so yeah so uh, you're up in you're in you're in the dakotas and I know there's a lot of tin up there. Is there still a lot of good, solid cars up there? There is, yeah. So yeah. North Dakota has looked over a lot for classics just because, right. of, you know, planes or whatever. But there's there's no rust in North Dakota. They don't I sell it. dry. They, yeah. they don't do nothing with the roads. I mean, it's it's a dry winter. It's a dry summer. So all the tin and metal up there is in really good shape. And what I've seen is a lot of the 30s to 50s metal is in pristine, what would be considered pristine condition by yeah. standards up there. The 60s, 70s, and 80s have been picked over, but um, you can see rows and rows of 30s, 40s cars, Plymouths, wow. Nats, you know, Studebakers, you name it. A lot of them still have glass. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable, actually. And, and up there, they just drag them on the rock piles, and they just sit on rock piles. So they're not even in the grass or the mud. They're up on rocks, so they don't rot. Wow. Yeah, I got I to gotta make a trip up there. John Derek, Barrett, if you had, I know you said you stepped up for the Barrett-Jackson. You, you spent Barrett-Jackson money on the Buick. Have you had anybody offer you crazy money for one of your builds? Go, I got to have that just for whatever reason. I mean, what do you do to, to, to unload? Can't yeah. keep everything. Yeah, so – about 12 years ago, I had a shop and we built what I call shiners, which is the shiny stuff. It makes me yeah. super nervous. And I, I got tired of it, to be honest. And um, I kept two of them. And about two years ago, I sold a 72 Chevelle that I built for myself. Uh, supercharged 355, Super T10, four speed, 12 bolt, had all the whatever. And... I got an offer that was considerably higher than what I was asking. And I told the guy, no. And he was like, well, what do you mean? No. And I said, I'm not, why would you pay that kind of money for my car? My asking price is my asking price. And it's just one of those things. Like I was almost offended that they were overpaying because of who I was or the channel versus what I was just asking for the car. You know what I mean? Um, but I have to say, overall, it's a little bit harder to sell cars today than it used to be. Um, you'd think it would be the opposite. But, yeah. Um, cars will sell, and then they'll sit for months, and I won't get paid, and I have to relist them, or folks don't show up, or whatever else. So um, normally, when I sell my cars today, I just put them up on eBay under a different name and uh, and just hope they do 
decent because if I list them locally, it's just a bunch of tire kickers and and empty promises. Unfortunately, I'm glad that people, you know, I'm happy that people want to meet me and stuff like that. But um, it's definitely made selling vehicles tough, <laughs> really tough. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Didn't, wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. About two weeks ago, I, we had uh, Steve Darnell on from Vegas Rat Rides. Yeah. And I was talking to Lou, it was probably three days ago, uh, you know, about your story and the similarities. And I don't know if you, you know Steve or are familiar yeah. with Steve. Yep. But his background and the same attitude as far as whatever you got, make it work. He welded. He started welding everything. His dad had an iron shop. And instead of buying anything, he made everything. Yep. And they would use old 32 Fords. He didn't get into the details there on the show, but they would use 32 Fords somehow, some way to bail hay, use it as machinery, whatever it was, they would make it work. I just thought it was cool. A couple things, the similarities, the background, the farmland, because he grew up in Montana, moved to Vegas later. Yeah. The, the, the attitude, his father was a key player in, in getting him up and doing his thing and setting that groundwork. And I'm saying this, Derek, you already know, but there's people listening to take that that for granted and go, yeah, whatever. I'm there. I'm not there. Cats in a cradle type shit. But also what was pretty cool is I don't know if you've seen his channel. His channel on YouTube is Make It Run Again. Your shows are, are similar of take it from one spot, see what you can do no matter what it is and get it from A to B. Have you seen his work? Yeah, yeah. Um, Steve's a great guy. We actually talk quite a bit, and um, he's a good have, dude. Yeah, he's 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 good stuff. He's gold. I mean, that dude is um, not to get discursive, but he he is an absolute artist. Like that yeah. guy. I mean, he he's not a mechanic. He's not a car guy. That guy is out of this world metal artist and just applies it to cars. Yeah, he's yeah. like. He's the Bob Ross of cars, but um, no, we had a, a few different phone calls about his show and what he was doing. And um, I, I hope to actually do some stuff with him in the future because it's pretty similar, you know. Um, yeah, you know, he and Merle will fly in or drive in wherever, buy some old truck or car, get it running. And uh, the nice twist on his thing is he'll try to sell it by the time he gets home, which is yeah, brilliant. yeah, he was telling us that. Yeah, yep. it's very smart. Um, I actually cool. almost bid on that crew cab. <laughs> the other day. <laughs> was it a Ford that he just, what was it that he Chevy. just had? The one he just had not Fair long market. ago. Yeah. No, it was a Chevy crew cab. Chevy. Yeah. It was a yeah. crew cab. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, but no, I mean, like he gets it, you know, it's just minimalist. Do what you got to do. Make it work. Um, I've seen him make push rods out of stuff that shouldn't be push rods and, and uh, I've been through his shop tour and looked at his cars, and and it's just unbelievable the craftsmanship and the artistry, and and just looking at pieces and and what he substitutes for normal parts is just like mind blowing. Like that guy. Yeah, out of yeah. Lou and I were talking. You, what, you pictures, you see video, you watch the show, Vegas Rat Rods, whatever, and you're like, yeah, I get it. But when you see it in person. It, it takes you a good 40 minutes to take the car in, to look oh, at everything and stand there. What the easily. hell is he thinking? I mean, it's just yep. crazy, crazy. Yeah. Down. So his Tri-5 Haunted, I think I stood next to that car. It must have been legitimately two hours. I mean, my legs were hurting. I was just walking around it. And every time you made a circle, you would say, geez, I didn't see that last time. Yeah. And yeah. it was another detail and another detail. And the same with that car, the Joker. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, compound, right. turbo, supercharged, diesel. I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. But it's all used parts. It's junk. It's scrap iron. It's you know, I have a lot of respect for that guy for sure. Yeah, for real. Yeah, I thought that was similar. You know, the stories, the the baseline, the work ethic. I was just, you know, I thought that was pretty cool. And I think people need to see that because you know they take it for granted. Go, yeah, you just dropped here, no big deal. But no, there's a, there's somebody else behind you, you know, that Absolutely. showed you what's happening and and actually, you know, set the baseline and made you who you are. Outside of your grandpa and your and your dad, 
and Lou was touching on this. Was there any other car builders that you looked up to maybe even before YouTube that you thought that's pretty cool shit? Excluding yeah. Lou, of course. Yeah. We ain't gonna talk yeah. about Lou. No, not me. <laughs> I probably watched Lou. I've probably watched um I'd say 60, 65 episodes of you on tv isn't that weird i mean that's a long time you yeah. put years yeah on. i was i was on for a while yeah Three, 14 sure. years i mean it was like i had to see lou see what he was doing on tv and um but no i mean it's um there was a guy named rogers weifel who owns weifel motors in piedmont south dakota and he has another shop in scotland south dakota um he mentored me when i was in high school and um when i was in high school he had about 210 cars wow. and I, I think he's down to about 140 now uh, 135 140 and reason for that is i bought most of them <laughs> but <laughs> but um real real old school he taught me how to do body work with lead we were doing mustang two front ends when they weren't a thing we were right. doing GMA body front uh, front end swaps when they weren't a thing. We were putting, um, you know, big Buick like Wildcat Lesabre rear ends and fifties Buicks when that wasn't a thing. Um, and and he just kind of had the concept and the vision and and I didn't really under fully understand what I was doing then. I was just following direction and welding and cutting and torching and hammering. And looking back today, like he was a legit hot rodder. Yeah, and had a huge influence on what I do today. I mean, we would take a fifty Oldsmobile, put a Mustang two front end on it, put a four ninety six Chevy in it, put a Power Glide in it, make the whole interior, and we would do like lacquer paint, which no one does anymore. Yeah. You know? And um, I just I treasure those times because it's just stuff that no one does anymore, you know and. I spent a lot of time out there today. He's 86 now. So hmm. I like to go out and reminisce with him and chew on the fat. And I try to buy a car or two from him here or there to keep things afloat for him. But um, he also kind of helped um, push my love for Buicks. Of course, I grew up with a Buick, that, that 56, but he's a big Buick guy as well. So he's probably got 30, 40 Buicks. Um, and, uh, he was definitely a huge, huge mentor for me. It's just one of those things where you don't realize in that time and space, how much you're learning and absorbing until, you know, two decades down the road, you look back and go, wow, that guy was a huge yeah. inspiration in my life. You know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Speaking of Buicks, you still got that 68 LeSabre? Hmm. The Lasabinator. Lasabinator, <clears throat> yes, the Lasabinator. Yeah, no, I still have that one. Um, I just hit it with a lawnmower today, actually, riding lawnmower. <clears throat> That's how I know I still have it. <laughs> Dude, um, my mom had a '67. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I'd love, I love that car, man. That was a cool car. Man, that thing, it just floats down the road. Awesome. I mean, You're just. Awesome. I would put that thing up against a new Cadillac any day. I mean, yeah. you, you fall asleep in that thing. No, I still have it. Um, what does it need? I, I can't find a gas tank for it. I can't find an OEM gas tank. Um, needs a radiator and I think some brake work. Um, but other than that, it runs great. I mean, I plan on keeping that one for quite a while. That was Roger, who I was just talking about. That was his parents' car. They bought it brand new from the dealer. Wow. Um, so I, I definitely want to hang on to that one. Um, but I just, I can't find a fuel tank for that thing. It's what about thing. like a Chevelle tank? Because it's about, it's the same style, isn't it? You would think, but instead of being rectangular, you know, wide ways as a trunk, it's the opposite. It's like narrow yeah wise towards the axle so it's an odd fuel tank i haven't been able to find one i'm probably going to end up having to get this one uh just refurbished or something or coated um but i can't even find the sending unit or the sock or anything it's wow. pretty bizarre what about getting one made that's a potential i thought about just putting a fuel cell or you know something in it 
Um, the thing runs too dang good just to sit there. Right. It's the 400 model, so it's got the high output 350 and the turbo 400 in it yep. and, and everything else. So that thing will do a one-tire fire for two city blocks. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, I did, I, um, I've had... I've had tanks made by Rick's tanks and rock Valley. And what I, what I've done in the past is I draw up exactly what I need the size, you know, like a 3d drawing as best I can and where I want everything. And they've nailed, both of them have nailed it every time I've done about six tanks like that for just weird stuff that I've built and they'll put everything you need. In it. And I really like what rock Valley does because what, like if you're putting a fuel injected motor in or you want to run an aftermarket EFI setup, you tell them what you got and they'll put like a vet pump in it. So when you get, oh. you get it, you'll have, you know, you just go to the store and say, I got an 04 vet and I need the fuel pump for it. And it's all set up. It's got the ring. It locks in everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm you might have to do something like that. It's not, not cheap. Bad idea. But it's not cheap, but every time I've done it with something oddball, they send me a set of straps with it. Done. Put it in like it belongs there. Well, just, uh, you know, if you can reduce three hours of fighting and hitting it with a Tanya Harding and pry bar, it's worth the money in the end, you know. So I'd kind of like to put EFI on that and get the AC working and, and just make it a family cruiser. So That'd be cool. That might be worth it. Appreciate the lead. I wrote that down. So. Derek, what do you what do you have coming up around the corner? You got anything in the pipeline? You're going to drop? What, what's up? Yeah. Um, what is today again? Wednesday or something? Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Nineteenth. Nineteenth. So next week I get my class six. Well, hopefully I get my class six NHRA drag racing license. So I'll oh. be able to run sixes. I think. Um, and then I go straight to Summit Drag Week, and I'm racing one of Tom Bailey's cars for a week. And then from that, I get a couple days off, then I go to Rocky Mountain Race Week, and I'm racing Motion Works El Toro, which is a 1,200 horsepower Fox body um, Mustang that runs about 840s, 850s. And I'm doing that, and then I go straight into... Hot Rod Drag Week, which I hope to have my 777 race car done, which is a 38 Chevy Coupe. And um, we're doing that old school. It's going to have a five-speed manual and a roots blower and, and some nitrous, just kind of old school. And then straight from that to um, Hot Rod Power Tour. There you go. Pretty much all the way through the end of August. I'm, yeah, that's I'm a schedule there. Booked, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about doing the hot rod power tour. It'd be a first yeah. for me. I, 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 Lou, have you done? You've done the hot rod power. You did it on. Yeah, the, we did uh, one of the hot, shows. Yeah, we did it with the show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did the last. We we didn't do the first stop. We did the rest. Yeah, if you guys go, let me know. It'd be fun to to hook up and cruise or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we were talking about. Lou was pushing to, to take. I got a '62 Lincoln convertible. He was pushing last week to get that out. I just got the transmission rebuilt. That's ready to go. But I'm talking, I, my daily driver is a 2010 Tahoe police vehicle with the push bar, the cattle crusher in the front. Oh, nice, yeah. I clear out the left lane. It's good for running. Like, I just had to go to West <laughs> Virginia last week to do a project. And I can run 110 miles an hour not worry about anything. I mean, the cops wave. When I run through a speed trap at 90, they do the, okay, I run. I mean, I just keep, yeah. I just keep going everywhere I go. You just, cop, yeah, go ahead. Dude. That's right. <laughs> a new sheriff in town. But yeah. I keep saying we put a puffer on that and take it through the hot ride power tour. I think it would be pretty cool to run it because we could sleep in and be the first ones there after everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get some omelets in the morning and a Bloody Mary and then just head out late and get there early. I like that. That's we were idea. also talking, uh, the idea was Brian Johnson from ACDC has said who, he agrees to come on, but he doesn't want to talk about ACDC. And I wanted to call him on the carpet and go, listen, we're going to do the power tour. We'll run block for it because he's got a uh, General Lee. And he could run that thing behind us at 100 miles an hour, knowing that ain't nothing going to happen to him. We can get in front or behind him and still have a good time. 
Yeah. But I think we should, we could have some stories zipping 200 miles a day in, you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> Easy. Awesome. The worst part about power tour is just sitting in the dang old traffic. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You're, it, it's 95 degrees and you got a back waterfall going on and the, you know, the kids are crabby and you can't find no good radio stations. And it's just everything bad that could happen is happening, you know, but if you can get around that. Yeah. Well, we can put the lights on and zip through around the left lane. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I got to ask, I got to ask, what's the deal with the 74 K five blazer? 70. Oh, the blue one. The blue one. Uh, the hard top so yes. uh that actually belongs to roger my good friend um so that's for sale actually um a good running truck it just sat forever there was a bad hailstorm up in south dakota probably oh 11 years ago it was probably softball size hail i mean i lost a couple of omegas a nova a few cadillacs uh, just absolutely, you know, destroyed with hail. And um, that's the only reason he stopped driving that blazer is I think the window got smashed. He did replace it, but uh, it's still for sale. It's sitting there. I think he's got three or four blazers sitting there for sale. He wasn't going to sell it. And then I got it running and he was like, well, I guess I, if I got a good enough offer, he'd get rid of it. And he's not asking a bad price. I think he wants like 4000 is all or something yeah. Comes with quarter, new quarter panels, new fenders. Yeah, I'm looking for I'm looking for the whole windshield and a top. That would be the. Tr I mean, just take the whole truck. Yeah, you got parts galore and another runner. You yeah. know, because I've got a I got an '87 that needs floors, and I was thinking about making it where I can take the whole top off because I prefer the whole top off versus the yeah pickup truck style. You know what I mean? I just don't like them. Yeah, it, it's it was kind of weird how they did that. It was like it just seemed odd to buy a blazer to take essentially a topper off, right? The whole roof, you know. What yeah, I mean? it's just, it's, it's, yeah, I, it, yeah. It, it weird. seemed weird, but it's yeah, weird. when I was younger, we'd go wheeling in that thing and taking the whole roof off with that factory roll bar in there. It was yeah, it was so cool. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, lot and of I think fun. they just look cool with the whole top off. Oh, absolutely! You know, it just they just look cool. That's that's why I want to do that thing. I, but I, but finding a roof and finding the whole windshield opening is impossible. You're fine when that's been wrecked really bad and it's still there, but there, it's not an easy yeah. task. I've been looking, and it's it's not easy. That's for damn sure. No, no, and most of them are rolled, so yeah. the tops aren't any good, and the eight pillars mm -hmm. are gone, and the glass is gone, and and everything else, but. That one's been babied, and I think it's had an engine swap. And what's the all-wheel drive transfer case? The two hundred three, or is it a two hundred five? Two hundred five, if I'm not mistaken, is the cast iron one. Is that the so, chain chain driven? Yeah. Drive? So I would say two hundred three, maybe. Is the so, all-wheel drive one? I guess. Yeah, that's the only maybe downside is it's the all-wheel drive version. But you know, yeah, you could sell that. You can sell oh, that and put a better transfer case in it. Yeah. They're desirable. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good rig. He's um, Whenever he gets ready to sell his collection, it's going to be something else because there is a lot of neat, neat stuff for sure. A lot of 40 Fords, um, 50s, Mopars and Chevys, Oldsmobiles, um, a ton of tri fives, louvered hoods, old school hot rods, stuff. Like yeah, that. it's gonna be pretty cool. That's very cool. That's very cool. All right. Well, you know what? We have chewed up an hour of your time. That one's quick, actually. Yeah, yeah. See, that's gonna be let you talk. <laughs> we let you lose track of time. That's what we did. I do have to ask you one. I have to ask you one more question. And my friend Vinny sent me a text while we were sitting there. I started flashing across my phone. He wanted to know if you were in the military. So I get asked this a lot, actually, because clearly it looks like I was. But um, I actually was not in the military. I'm just a uh, huge supporter and fan. My family has been in the military for since the beginning of my family. Um, and I've just seen the positives and negatives that military does. And... Mm -hmm. I just try to support veterans like yourself and thank you for your service. 
And uh, I'm, I'm just blessed to live in a country that we have brave men and women that are willing to fight every day for us. And I just want to give back. That's my whole thing is yeah, yeah. I can't do it. So, you know, let's pray and be thankful for those that can. You know? Yeah. Derek, Thank I don't you. know if you're reading the comments, but there was two that I wanted to point out. One of them was a guy said he took on his restoration project, gave it a shot because of you. The That's other true. guy said he started his YouTube channel because you inspired him to do that. That's very cool. You should know, listen, you're doing the right thing. You're, yeah. you're, you know, you're getting people up talking and it's all positive. There's nothing negative. I don't see any, I've been looking at the comments. I don't see anything where anybody's miserable and hateful. Keep doing what you're doing, dude. Yeah, you know I what I'm saying? It. I appreciate it. You know, end of day, the car community is just, it's a bunch of really awesome folks like you guys. I mean, we all want the same thing, right? Keep hot rods live, have right. fun, enjoy what you do, go to bed with a smile on your face and, and try to pass the torch, right? So it's just, exactly. I'm super blessed to be doing what I'm doing. And I guess I call it work, but really I get to play every day. And I'm just thankful for those that watch the channel and and support us as a group, you know? Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And, oh, someone wants to know when you want to come up and tour Canada. <laughs> I order open. Carson, will Derek come up and tour Canada? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll make that the last one. You want to go to Canada? <laughs> so, true story, I went to, I bought a Corvair um, on the Canadian border. It was painted <laughs> like a flag, of course. And uh, I tried to get over the border, and the guy was like, dude, if I let you across, you know, it's two weeks. You got to sit up there. And I was like, well, you got maple syrup and bacon and stuff. And I, think he was, <laughs> I think he was getting, you know, taking offense to it. But I was, you know, I was genuinely like, let's go. Let me over. And, um, no, I, I tried to get over, and they, and they wouldn't let me. Um, apparently, the job <laughs> isn't as important as I as I hoped it was, but uh, no, when the border's open, I'm definitely going to Canada. I've got DeBoss Garage and Classic Mustangs and, and uh, DD Speed Shop, Dan. Yeah, Dan. Uh, you know, there's there's a dozen folks up there that I'd love to go meet and, and just do some hot rod stuff and, and have fun, but I got to be able to get back. That's the thing. So, yeah, yeah. Dirk, what are you running? What are you thinking of running in the Hot Rod Power Tour? Uh, probably the, the 74 C 20 crew cab, uh, it's okay. C notch drop six inches. We're doing an LS swap for L80, um, air conditioning, cowhide seats, you know, going old school. Yep, that sounds cool. Um, but I have like none time to finish that. So that's yeah, good. Right. You know, yeah. uh, but if that doesn't work, we're going to take the Cadillac. That's kind of the backup plan because I, all I got to do with that is some brake lines and some tires and just send it. You know, we'll figure it out on the road. Basically, cool. Sounds cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's shut this bad boy down. I just want you to know, thanks for coming on, Derek. And remember, next week, Justin Padfield, the owner of Scott's Hot Rods, is coming on. And if you want to get with us. You want to send us an email? It's three lefts don't at gmail.com. Just remember that the number three lefts don't at Gmail. All right. And remember to follow, like, share, do all those things because without you guys, we can't do what we do and we can't talk to people like Derek and bring them to you into your house. John, thanks a lot. Ken, Ryan, fantastic job. It was their, it was our, their first run. And uh, we'll see you guys later. I'm out. Lou Santiago. Have a nice day.